Hello and welcome to the Financial Times. Today I'm joined by financial historian Russell Napier, author of Anatomy of the Bear and a global macro strategist at CLSA. Russell, you haven't just written about the bears, uh, you also are also known as one of the biggest of the bears yourself. You forecast the S&P 500's heading towards 400 at some point from its current 1300 or so. Uh, should we just be bailing out of equities everywhere around the world? Okay, things are different around the world. There's a very major discrepancy between equity valuations. Just going back to that rather startling 400 number, that's based on the equities in America going back to their low for their cyclically adjusted PE. Uh, it's not just on some great macro calamity. There's actually some history to back this up and suggest they can get that cheap. The good news is, elsewhere in the world, there are markets who are getting down very close to these very low valuation levels, which historically have represented great buying opportunities. And everybody watching this will not be surprised to know that that is basically Europe. Do you think we should be buying Europe? I don't think we should be buying Europe today. We want to add some more value around the, the sheer valuation issue. The valuation issue will give you a very good steer on long-term returns, so it suggests that the best long-term returns in global equities will be in Europe. And but that long-term return is a 10-year return, and it doesn't mean anything about what's going to happen uh, in the next 12 months. So this is, this is the, the cyclically adjusted P ratio, the Schiller PE, just for people who aren't aware, being the average of uh, the price compared with the average of earnings over the last 10 years. Yes, that's yeah. correct. And in Europe, we are seeing it at levels that historically across the globe have produced wonderful returns. In fact, many of the European markets are now close to where they were in 1982, before the beginning of the great bull market. But I want to stress that this will not help you with the next 12 months, but should be very helpful with the next 10 years. So you should start dribbling money in maybe now already into but, this? P potentially, because obviously none of us are really bright enough to call the exact bottom of the market. I'd have a, I would have a very strong view on what will the bottom of the market will look like, and basically it will be when we get a real strong enfranchised central bank in any of these European countries to aggressively go for reflation. Now that can either be the massive change at the European Central Bank, or actually each nation getting back its own central bank. But that will be the trigger point when it comes to add some value around the fact that they're cheap, but also they should start going up. Right. Presumably if we get back to a situation of each country having its own central bank at the end of the death of the euro, there would be a calamitous drop in share prices and in fact lots of assets at that moment. Well, there, there, there will probably, well, what should happen is some currencies should go, so they should get a lot cheaper. I'm not sure that the equity prices will actually go down very much. I realise the, uh, the pain associated with breaking up the euro, but I don't think it's as uh, calamitous for equities because they're already pricing in a great deal of pain. And you know, if I can just leave people watching this with one message, is sometimes equities get so cheap that they can discount just about everything. I would say the only thing that equities can't discount when they're really cheap is the seizure of those assets by the government, which clearly you couldn't rely on in some jurisdictions, mm -hmm. or the destruction of those, those uh, assets by enemy bombing. So but historically, when they're this cheap, it doesn't really matter what comes in the macro perspective. So we're all talking about macro, 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 economics and everything else. But when they're very cheap, they're discounting just about everything. And we're, and we're getting close, but it's not yet. OK, well, we'll have to hope we don't get any enemy bombing. But um, does it, it, are there particular countries one should focus on? I mean, at the moment, obviously, people are preferring Germany. Uh, but should we really should we think about going for the absolute cheapest? Uh, I mean, buying Greece, for example. Yeah. Or if you can find good companies, you should buy them in the most distressed areas. Mm -hmm. When we get an enfranchised central banker, what he's going to do is create more inflation. Now, the equities in Greece are not discounting poor growth; they're discounting bankruptcy. Mm. This is the you know the lesson of my book is that in the bottoms, the market is saying that a deflationary contraction means it could go to zero because equity isn't an asset, it's a fine sliver of hope between assets and liabilities. So anything that comes along that stops the bankruptcy sends the share prices up. It doesn't have to be that we transform Greece into a wonderful growth economy to get the equity market going up. It's simply rem significant removal of the bankruptcy risk. And once we get past deflation, we've removed that. So if you can find good companies in Greece, and it is a micro-investing story, the CAPE and the low valuations will tell you where to look. You've got to go down there and find those companies. But once we've discovered that the Greece is not going to deflate any further, then there's a significant rise in equity valuations because the risk of bankruptcy is massively reduced. Okay. And very quickly, if we turn back to the States, um, you're obviously suggesting things are going to get very much worse there. Um, but of course, we have a central bank there already willing not just to print money, but to, I mean, uh, from what Ben Bernanke wrote in the past, to do helicopter drops of money to mm -hmm. prevent deflation. Should that not give us some confidence on the uh, same basis? That should not give us some confidence. That should undermine our confidence. The, the fundamental problem for America is that around 45% of all its sovereign debt is owned by foreigners. Now, the foreigners so far have been patient with QE1 and QE2. This is, a, this is a, a, a state which prints money to pay off its foreign creditors. Now, if it was called Argentina, 
nobody would be lending it any money. So there is definitely an issue if the king has no clothes. Now that's a meaningless statement if we don't have some catalyst. But I think there's a very clear catalyst for this issue coming home to roost, which is the, the valuation of the Chinese currency. The RMB is trading within its bands. It's trading set by market prices. It's not at the top end or the bottom end, which means that the PBOC is not a buyer or seller of American government debt. This is the Chinese central this bank. This is the, the Chinese PBOC. central bank. But there is a problem, and I think it's something which, which could crystallize any time. I think there's a real risk that this currency will go to the bottom end of its band. And on that day, we can guarantee that the PBOC, the biggest owner of treasuries, uh, probably after the Federal Reserve now, will be a seller of treasuries. And then these issues that we ask about foreigners funding the American government mm -hmm. really come home to roost incredibly quickly. So that we are focusing on Europe. The biggest story in the world, actually, is that we now have to live in a world where the Chinese exchange rate is no longer undervalued, and that has major consequences for funding the US government. So effectively, the worry for the US is a collapse in the dollar, prompting then a collapse in equities. I think it's the Treasury market. That's the worry for the United the States. Market. It's a okay. lack of funding for the United States government from foreigners who have dominated the funding for the government, throwing the burden on the people of America and American savers. And frankly, if we have to reallocate savings in America to the government, we're going to reallocate it away from the private sector. And this is the world that we're going to live in for, for I think, a couple of decades now. Because for the last 18 years, the American people had a funding holiday on their government because the PBOC and other central bankers did it for them. Okay. Great. Well, pretty gloomy view there, but thank you very much for your time, Russell. Very interesting to hear. Thank you.